Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation. My name is Janine Donnelly. I am the manager of webinars for IBM Systems Magazine, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Today's webinar, Unsecured SSH Keys to Your IT Enterprise Left Under the Door Mat, Universal SS SSH Key Manager, or UKM. I would like to introduce you to our featured speakers today. From SDS, we have Brian Lampy. Brian is in the Marketing and Communications Department at SDS. I'm also pleased to introduce Matthew McKenna from SSH. Matthew is the Chief Strategy Officer and VP of Key Accounts. Matthew brings over 15 years of high technology sales, marketing, and management experience to SHH Communications Security. His expertise in strategically delivering technology solutions that anticipate the marketplace has helped the company become a market leader. Also from SSH, Jimmy Mills is the global pre-sales engineer lead at SSH and has 20 years of IT experience. Jimmy's been at SSH for four years and 16 years with a major retail firm. His range of experiences include Unix, administration, Storix, access control, and file transfer. With our introductions complete, Brian, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Janine, and thank you to IBM Systems for hosting this webcast. I'd like to introduce you to two other attendees today who will be joining us for the Q&A session. Colin Vandeross is a senior systems engineer here at SDS and has over 25 years of experience in IT. He has been at SDS for over eight years now, focused on network software solutions and security solutions. Deb Hodson is a sales manager at SDS and has 30 plus years in the IT business, having been at IBM, HP, Candle, and now SDS, all in sales and consulting roles. Our agenda for today. We will start with Matthew McKenna from SSH. He will provide an introduction to SSH user keys and why you should care. He will then outline uncontrolled access, risks, and management of SSH keys, as well as audit compliance with an introduction to NIST IR 7966. We will follow with a brief Universal Key Manager demo by Jimmy Mills. As Janine mentioned, we will have a Q&A session after the demo. Before I pass the presentation off to Matthew, I would like to introduce SDS. Software Diversified Services has been providing mainframe solutions to the market for over 34 years. Our headquarters are located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. SDS is a leading provider of enterprise infrastructure software for multiple platforms, including ZOS, MVS, VSC, and VM mainframe systems, along with a growing mix of distributed products. We are proud of our world-class support with a 30-plus year history of delivering award-winning support and customer-centric IT infrastructure solutions for over 1,000 clients worldwide. Our flagship products are dedicated to network management, security solutions, and performance solutions. SDS has over 20 enterprise-wide products. Our developed staff is continually providing rich, robust updates and enhancements to our products. The SSH product solution, SSH Tectia, has been a part of our array of SDS Enterprise product offerings. We are pleased to announce that we have added Crypto Auditor in addition to Universal Key Manager, which will be our focus today. Lastly, I would like to take this time to mention that SSH Communications and Security has been awarded as the 2016 winner of a Golden Bridge Award in Encryption Key Management for the innovations to the Universal Key Manager product. The Golden Bridge Awards is an annual industry and peer recognition program honor the best companies of all types and sizes worldwide. Enough from the marketing team. It is now my pleasure to pass it off to our lead presenter, Matthew McKenna. Matthew? Thank you for the introduction, Brian, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I think we got a really exciting session here for everybody. One of the things that I guarantee out of all of my sessions is that you're going to learn something new today. You see my first title there, it says SSH user keys, access to your mainframe out of control. Don't be misled by the title. We're gonna cover this from a holistic perspective. We're gonna look at this, how it impacts the enterprise as is mentioned in the original title of what we set forth here. But we're also gonna take a vantage point from the mainframe. So keep that in mind as we go along. 
So what is it that we're going to cover today? First off, why should I care about this topic? And there's a couple points that we're going to cover in here. First, I'm going to set the premise, is SSH the big short of the security industry today? We'll talk about that in a second. And I'll take you through a little SSH 101 about what the encryption protocol is doing. We'll talk about key-based access and what that actually means and why that actually implies uncontrolled access. And then we're going to talk about how this really touches everything in our environment, not only our on-premise environment, but in the direction that many of our organizations are moving in terms of cloud transformation and digital transformation. And then from there, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at what the risk looks like. And we're going to take that first from the perspective of what it looks like within a distributed environment, but then we're also going to take the vantage point of this perspective from the mainframe. How is this also impacting our mainframe environment? And what does this reality look like? And why does it look like this? And then what are some of the common misconceptions out there today about mitigating the risk around SSH user key base access? And then finally, we'll also come with solutions, not just problems today. We're going to talk about the compliance aspect of this. And then how do we actually get this challenge under control in our environments? What are the regulators saying? How do I mitigate the risk around this? And how do I achieve a better state within my enterprise around SSH user key based access? So let's start off with the first question. SSH, The Big Short. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie, The Big Short, but I'll give you a little bit of background about this. This gentleman here in this picture is, of course, Christian Bale, but he played the role of Michael Burry in the movie, The Big Short. And The Big Short was about the subprime mortgage loan crisis and how basically we had all these loans piled up on top of each other, all given a very nice credit rating, but actually it was all just junk piled up on top of each other. Now, what are the similarities to this? I'm going to try to make a couple of parallels here in this argument. One is when it came to the subprime mortgage loan market, first, regulators weren't really aware of what was going on and how these tools were being set up. Second, consumers of these, let's say, derivatives, these credit default swaps, as they were called, were also not aware and really didn't understand how they functioned. And then finally, there was little understanding as to what the overall financial impact would be when this all came tumbling down. And Michael Berry had the foresight to look into this and was able to predict this in advance and saw that this was really going to come to a head. And so I'm going to try to draw some parallels here. And you can tell afterwards if I'm totally off my mark here and I'm really making a stretch here. But I see some real fun parallels along the way as we're discussing this. So let's jump into why is this problematic? Really, you're looking here at the SSH protocol. Don't fall asleep yet. The SSH protocol, it has two primary use cases within our enterprises. First, remote administrative access. It is the tool of choice for remote administrative access into our networks. It is used for gaining access to network devices, such as routers, switches, firewalls. It gives us access to our servers. It is deployed essentially everywhere SSH. It comes pre-deployed on all of our Unix Linux infrastructure. It is sitting on our mainframe, it's sitting on our Windows box, it's sitting in these network devices as I managed, and SSH is the primary tool of remote administrative access. So that's one use case. The second use case is, is it's one of the primary means of which we securely move data between applications within our organizations, from other organizations within our organizations, and from our organizations into the cloud. Now, there's three layers to the SSH protocol. There's something known as the host authentication layer, and that in very simple terms basically means that this client has the right to speak to this SSH server. There's a user authentication layer that basically says that this user on this client may access this server. And then finally, there's the third part of the protocol called the subchannels, and this is really the part that organizations don't really have under control very well. This is where some of the nasty things happen in terms of the misuse of the SSH protocol, meaning tunneling across from non-production environments into production environments, using agent forward forwarding to, let's say, gain remote access back to a desktop that's outside of our environment, bypassing corporate firewall policy. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to get this under control, what's actually going on in the protocol, because most of our organizations, we don't really have good visibility of what's going on inside the SSH protocol 
let alone the access challenges of managing the protocol as well. So two use cases to keep in mind, remote administrative access and secure file transfer. And we're going to talk about now why this is problematic. Very quickly, SSH 101, because we're going to be talking a lot about public key authentication here. I want to talk about two pieces to this. And I want you to think today as we're speaking that the private key is your key. It's like the key to your house, the key that you own. And the public key is the lock to the door of your house. Now, think about it very simply from your normal perspective of getting into your house. If you would lose your house key, what would you have to do to ensure that your house is still secure? You would go out and you would have to change the locks to your house. Unfortunately, most of us will just go copy a new key. However, what I want you to keep in mind out of that statement is that all the control related to access when it comes to key-based authentication is sitting on the lock side of the equation, on the public key, public key side of the equation. Now, that's not to say that the private key is not an important piece. It is your identity key. It is yours. It's belonging to you. It's important that you control this. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. But remember that the control will sit on the public key side of the equation. So SSH is literally the plumbing that's bridging our environments together. If you think of those two use cases that I just talked about in terms of on-site, on-premise access for remote administrator access, as well as securely moving data between applications, totally relevant use cases. However, we're also utilizing SSH to gain access into our cloud environments as well as move data into our cloud environments. If you think of the entire emergence of DevOps these days, think about what is the threat in keeping DevOps together. If a programmer is uploading code into GitHub, they're using SSH keys very frequently. If we're moving that code for test automation, we're moving it to Jenkins, we're using SSH keys to move it along that path. As we get it to our orchestration tools and we're moving that code into our cloud environments, we're using SSH keys very frequently to move that code into our cloud environment. So SSH is going to play an integral part in our transformation into our cloud environments as we go forward as well. And then let's think about our supply chain. Think about all of our remote vendors gaining access into our environment. Maybe you've outsourced management of your firewalls in your organization, or you have files that are being sent in by third parties into your organization very frequently SSH and SFTP are being used. So we have to take into consideration that our supply chain is becoming more and more intertwined here. And SSH is literally a plumbing that's bridging these environments together here. So let's talk about SSH user keys and why is this access out of control? SSH user keys, unlike any other form of access that's out there, has three very unique properties to it. First, SSH user keys are the only form of access that a user can provision themselves without oversight. So anyone with an SSH client, unless that server says, unless there's public key authentication restrictions on that server, anyone who has RSA key gen and a client, an SSH client, can generate themselves a private public key pair. Secondly, unlike SSL certificates and unlike certificates, SSH user keys don't have expiration dates. So they continue to sit out there as long as they continue to sit out there. And if we don't remove them, they continue to sit out there and they continue to grant that same access there. And third, unlike other forms of identity, if we think of passwords or certificates, they don't necessarily associate themselves to an identity. So we can't necessarily see from a key immediately just by looking at it, whether this belongs to an interactive usage use case or a machine-to-machine -machine use cases, application-to-application -application connection. You can go look inside the private key and see if there's comments on there and see if that belongs to John or someone else. However, just by eyeballing it, you can't see actually the use case associated to it. So as a result of this, a very large problem has evolved over the years, and we call it access out of control. Now, there are two sides of this equation, and you see I have a nice little iceberg there. If we think about what we're going to see, and I'm going to, I'm going to correlate this with some data going forward in a couple of case studies, what we're seeing out there when it comes to SSH user key-based access, 20% of the identities that you will find in your environment are interactive in nature, meaning flesh and blood users that are using key-based access to gain access to machines or maybe network devices or cloud assets there, right? So 
there's tools out there that are focused in on this space as an extension of the privilege access management area. However, the part that the solutions in the privilege access management space are not necessarily focused on is what's under the tip of the iceberg, the automated access, the machine-to-machine -machine access within our environment. And this is making up to 80% of the access in our environment, moving data between applications, moving data from our on-premise environments to our cloud, or moving data from off-premise environments into our environments using SFTP. It's absolutely critical to our security operations. If you think of the systems out there that have this automated access in nature, you can start to think of these payment processing systems, trading platforms, our SAP, our Oracle, all utilizing SSH key-based authentication to create connections within our environment. So keep that in mind is that there's two pieces to the SSH user key challenge in our environment. There's the interactive access component of this, and there's also the automated access component to this. And you see there's a lot more under the water that we actually haven't really been taking a look at over the years. So let's jump in here to a couple of case studies that will be really interesting to give you a little bit more insight of actually what this looks like inside of environment. So this first case study is something called a health check. It's where we go out and we help our customers gain a snapshot of their environment of how big of a challenge do I have around this space. And in, this, in these three pictures here, what you're actually looking at is 650 AIX hosts within a financial environment. So we were able to go out and scan this in environment, these 650 AIX hosts, match up private keys and public keys to their interactive and automated accounts, and start to gain some intelligence as to what's going on. So you have three pictures here, and if you take a look at that first picture on the left, what I call the cat's yarn ball, <clears throat> that is essentially an illustration of all the valid key pairs within the environment, the private keys, the public keys, and their associated interactive or automated access. So what you see there is essentially an unmanageable cobweb of trust relationships that you can't really get any understanding as to what this means. You just see that there's a lot of them there. Now, we start to break this down. When we start to think of the concerns around this access, we start to think, okay, how are people utilizing keys from an access perspective? The second one in the middle if you take a look at those two larger white dots in the middle, those are the jump posts in the environment. So this is basically where the interactive users are supposed to go through to gain access to those greener dots in the middle. And you see those red lines clearly going around those larger white circles. These are pictures of interactive users bypassing the jump post architecture to gain access into their production environment or test environment. So the challenge that's out there in the market space is that traditional privilege access management tools don't necessarily restrict the user from dropping in a key after they've gone through the jump host architecture. So very frequently, a developer will go through the jump host architecture, gain access to the server, drop in the key if they have the elevated privilege, and then in the future, they'll just use their key-based authentication to gain access to that server. So this is a real concern here, that we're not gaining the benefits of the controls of these let's say, jump host box in our environment for interactive access. Now, let's take a look at another concern. If you go to the third picture on the side here, what you're going to see is the segregation of duties challenge. Those green dots in the middle are the production environment of the customer, the very light green ones. And the ones at the top there, the two yellow dots at the top, these are the jump hosts, again, where interactive users are coming in. And the purple ones on the left side are the development UAT boxes. So you see interactive users coming into the development and UAT boxes, you see interactive users coming into the production boxes, but you also see a lot of connections. All these blue lines and purple lines into the green lines are coming from non-production environments into production environments using SSH user keys. So you clearly see here we have a segregation of duty issue across these 650 AIX servers. So let's expand this now to a real ongoing project of what we're seeing out there. This is an ongoing deployment project that we're running across a larger estate with about 20,000 hosts. They have mainframe, they have Windows, they have a lot of different flavors of Unix um, and Linux out there. And so far, we scanned about 6,750 hosts. Now, there's some key data points here that I want you to focus in on. So across those 6,750 hosts, we found 23,000 users. And you see the private key to public key ratio is close to about 1 to 10. So there was about 9,500 private keys found and 65,000 locks to the doors. Now, 
if we go in and we start to take a look at some of the interesting pieces here, on a private key, you can put a second factor of authentication, what is known as a passphrase. In 97% of the cases within this customer environment, there was no passphrase around that private key. So essentially, this can mean one of two things. This can mean that that private key was associated to automated access and machine-to-machine -machine connection, whereby normally a, a, a passphrase wouldn't be, or for interactive access, users are not putting passphrases around the private key. What does that mean? It means that the, pri the private key, if it is accessed by someone else, can easily be utilized without that second factor of authentication being forced upon it. Now, let's take a look at the locks to the doors, the authorized keys. <clears throat> the authorized keys, there's two things that you can do with an authorized key. One is you can dictate when setting up the key pair on the lock side from what IP source a private key may originate from. That is known as an IP source restriction. The second thing that you can do is you can put a force command on a key pair, which indicates what commands of the SSH protocol can be utilized during the SSH session that's being initiated. So this means you can, when you set up a key pair, dictate that this connection can only be used to do SFTP. In the customer's case here, what you can see is that 68% of the time, there was no IP source restriction. So that basically means if I have that private key to that lock, I can continue to elevate access and hop along in the environment. On the authorized keys with no force command, you see 99% of the time, there were no force command around those keys. So this means I can run all the other components of the SSH protocol if I have access to that key. Now, if we look at root-based access in the environment, we saw that 45% of the times there were no IP source restrictions. So that means a user with a root key can continue to jump across the environment in most cases. <coughs> in this case, we see that the keys in the environment were in general older, 75% of the keys were older than two years. It means that the customer has never rotated this key-based access in the environment, primarily because they have no visibility of that access. So as you can see, the keys with the largest risk were able to gain access to 6,730 of 6,750 of those servers. So almost the entire environment which we scanned. And then finally, let's take a look at a successfully closed project. So in this case, what's really interesting, so this was also a very large estate. We're talking 60,000 Unix servers. We were focused in this case across critical applications, about 515 critical applications across this environment. And essentially, this customer had been audited for unauthorized access, utilizing SSH user key-based access from non-production environments into production environments. We had to go out and discover the key-based trust in the environment, monitor how those keys were being used, lock down access to the environment by getting authorized keys off of users' home directories and moving those into a central root-owned location. This means that going forward in this environment, only people that could set up SSH user keys needed to have root access. And then we had to go remediate access in that environment so that every single key inside their production environment had an IP source restriction to provide accountability from where it was authenticating from. Now, some of the data points are really interesting here. Across 10,000 Unix Linux hosts, we found 1.5 million application keys, of which 10% were unknown and had root-level access. In comparison, we saw 70,000 database administrator keys and 70,000 sysadmin keys. So the interactive component to the automated component, about 10% to 90%. And what was most interesting, and if you look at the bottom, the most interesting statistic that should step out at you is that 90% of the access is obsolete meaning that we saw no key-based activity on these keys and the keys were no longer being used. So why has this problem grown so much? You can ask yourself these questions as we go along <clears throat> and you think about this. Is there someone who owns SSH user key-based access in your organization? Is there a policy in place for what a user or an automated process can and cannot do with SSH user key-based access? Is there a provisioning process inside our organization which dictates how we should provision this access? Normally what we see in environments is the process is very wild, wild west. Application owners get a request to set up a connection for a user or a connection between another application, and they'll basically task their IT administrator and say, please go set up this key-based authentication. That administrator will go set up the keys, test that everything works out, 
life is great, the business keeps running, and oops, I didn't keep an inventory of those keys, and we never know where they are after that day. So as a result of this, over 10 years of this continuous mismanagement of how this access has been provisioned, we don't have visibility out there of what's for interactive access, what is for machine-to-machine -machine based access. And as a result, we're not really monitoring because we don't have visibility, we're not actually monitoring how these keys are being used. And therefore, we don't have revocation processes in place and we don't have rotation processes in place and we're not able to remediate non-compliant access. Now, at the beginning when I talked about it, SSH has two use cases for interactive access, for remote administrators, and secure file transfer. SSH is also the tool of choice of hackers. Why? because they know that it's not controlled. They know that key-based access is not controlled. And as you've been maybe seeing in the press lately, is that, for example, in the case of Snowden, how did he gain lateral movement within his organization? Utilizing SSH keys, because he knew that they didn't have the process under control in terms of how they were being provisioned. Because if you remember at the beginning, anybody can provision an SSH user key. They don't expire, and they can't be associated. You can't necessarily see if it's for interactive or automated access. So let's take this from now another perspective. So we talked about this from a holistic view. We've taken a couple of case studies here. We've got an understanding of what the issue is out there. Let's take this now from the perspective of the mainframe because the mainframe is still an extremely important part of our IT infrastructures. However, like SSH, there's some parallels here in terms of mainframe risk is that mainframe is a very specialized area. In the majority of organizations that I visit, the mainframe is still siloed off from the rest of the organization. However, 70 to 80% of the data in the organizations is still, at some point, going through into our mainframe systems. Our core applications very much are still running on the mainframes. So we have very similar challenges there. There's a lack of understanding and skill sets in the mainframe space. As a result, auditors don't have a good understanding of basically what should consider, uh, compliance be considered in the mainframe space, and as a result, there's fewer security guidelines there. However, we have all this access coming from our distributed architecture, our Windows and Unix environments, which is gaining access into our mainframe, moving data into our mainframe. And so we need to be taking this into consideration from a holistic viewpoint that this is not just a Unix Linux problem. This is also touching our mainframes, our Windows environments, and our cloud environments there. And so the mainframe risk has multiple facets to it. So this is an example of just how a customer <coughs> is utilizing SFTP or FTPS within their environment. So you see that this is probably quite typical out there. Um, this customer, for example, if they're moving data from LPAR to LPAR, they may be using our Tectia SFTP, um, which converts the jobs into SFTP and moves that data from an LPAR to a workstation, they're using SFTP. If they're moving to the data to connect enterprise, they're using SFTP. And if they're gaining access to distributed cloud servers, they're using Tectia SFTP to, let's say, securely move that data. For third-party support side access, they're using FTPS here inside this customer. And then they also have their connect direct component there, as well as FTP still running in the organization. So this is very typical of what we see out in environments today when it comes to mainframes in terms of the movement of data um, around organizations. And the big question that we're, we always have and the big discussion that we always have with our customers out there is the SFTP versus the FTPS for automated access discussion. Is it easier to set up your distributed um, network to manage certificates to be able to leverage FTPS or is it more sensible because SSH and SFTP is the common standard on Unix and Linux to convert your job so that your jobs run in SFTP. And so this is always the big question there. And if you're utilizing SFTP, then you have to also be thinking about SSH user keys in terms of this interconnectivity with the mid-range. So also from the interactive perspective, RACF is excellent. However, if we typically look at this from both sides of the equation, um, of interactive access and automated access. Okay, interactive users, they'll come through RACF. Some organizations are using RACMAP to, let's say, bridge those identities to an LDAP to get gain greater visibility and auditing of what's going on 
while a user is gaining access to mainframe resources. However, for automated processes, the majority of the time, keys are being stored in the Unix file share system. And so we have to ask the questions, well, how good control do we have over those keys from the distributed platform that we are deploying into the mainframe? Have we put IP source restrictions on those? Do we have forced commands on those that this key-based access can only be utilized for SFTP? So also for the interactive side, how do we have security and visibility whether a user has enough elevated access to also drop in a key? So this is excellent, and RACF is a fantastic component there, which gives us a lot of security around the mainframe access. However, we also now have to start thinking about okay, are SSH user keys a part of this equation for automated and interactive access? Normally, we shouldn't see a lot of keys for interactive access on the mainframe. But for automated access, it's definitely another story. And we laugh. So here what you can see in this picture is you see a security gate, and you see the snow tire track bypassing the security gate there. Um, and we laugh at this here and think, why did they set up the security gate across this middle of this road here? Now, what I'm going to do in the next couple of slides is I'm going to actually walk you through a couple of real use cases of what we see out in the environment of how SSH user keys are, let's say, being used to bypass controls within our organization. And all of these use cases also apply within mainframe environments as well. The first simple one is, let's say, what I call example one, the jump server bypass. This is where a user is coming from the desktop, they're coming through a jump host architecture to gain access to an asset. If they have the elevated privilege and they're able to create that key, they can drop in a key and use agent forwarding back to their external computer or tunneling to bypass corporate firewall policy and exfiltrate data out of the organization. So this is one concern here. They can then set up that key also on their external computer and then they can access also that asset directly. So that was this first one. And you remember this picture here in terms of the red lines going past the jump host architecture here. So using key-based access, we can potentially bypass these. So we've already taken a look at that one. In terms of the non-production to production, you remember that second picture here. Again, it's a very similar scenario. The developer gain goes through the jump host architecture into the development environment. They tunnel across to production and they drop in their new key pair. And in some cases, you'll be surprised how much that this is seen. And now the developer has direct access into the production environments, and they can potentially run cron jobs or run scripts directly into the production environment. And this isn't because developers or administrators are bad-natured people. The point is that they want to gain access quickly to things because they have so many things to manage at a time, and they want to keep the business running. And to continuously go through jump post architectures to gain access to assets is often very time-consuming. So they drop in keys to speed this up. And then the third concern here is, if I have that elevated privilege, like we saw in that second um, example of the ongoing project, is that if I continue to elevate access, I continue to use SSH, and I continue to gain servers and drop in keys, I can have a transitive trust and move laterally across the organization and gain access to a numerous number of assets that normally I should not have access to. So this is what we would call potentially the Snowden effect here in this case. So what are we going to find out there when we go do this discovery across our environments? As you remember, 90% of the keys of what we're seeing inside customers are obsolete and unused. And we've shown some of these related issues when it comes to segregation of duties. We've talked about people bypassing jump post architectures. But you're going to find things out there like decommissioned application keys that shouldn't be sitting around. You're going to find shared private key scenarios. You're going to find keys that are very, very old. You're going to find keys with weak encryption on those. You're going to still find the occasional SSH1 key out there. You're going to find root and, and you're going to find sysadmin keys that have elevated privileges that they shouldn't have out in the environment. Data disaster recovery in HH and um, high availability keys and trust. So you're going to find a lot of different types of trust out there. And then you're going to have to start to think and say, what is the risk of remediating this access to my operation out in the environment, and what is the reward of remediating this access? And so that's what we're going to take a look at as we now go through here. So some of the quick misconceptions about risk mitigation. There's four things that I want to cover here. One is 
there's a big misconception there that if I have control of the private key, everything's okay. The fact of the matter is it's virtually impossible to control the private key. Why is that? Because I can very easily make a copy of my private key and give that to John before I can go on vacation, and John now has access to my private key. I can take that private key and hide that in the file, share where we can't find that. I can take that private key and put that on my USB stick. So it's very easy to move around with the private key. But what I don't have control of and what you do have control of within the enterprise is the server side of the equation, the public key side of the equation. Second, SSH keys are another key to be managed. So I can roll this in with my cryptographic services and I already managed certificates, I already managed encryption keys. Well, we're just gonna manage SSH keys now. This is one of the biggest misconceptions. SSH keys are different in that we pointed out those properties initially, that these are access related keys, that these are keys without expiration dates. So they don't have the same similar properties as a certificate when it comes to rotation of them. Key rotation is a must and it's highly important. This is another thing I hear a lot of talk about. This is something to be really careful about. Interactive access with SSH Choose Your Keybase Trust, sure, we can go out and rotate these. In fact, it's a great idea to do that in very similar concepts of the way passwords are rotated. However, when we start to think of as 80% under the iceberg of machine-to-machine -machine based access, now we have to start getting careful because if we don't have full visibility of that chain of trust, meaning all private keys and public keys that are associated to a process, if we start rotating things, we can very easily break the, act, break the process that's in place there. So this is a very big piece of it. And then finally, we need to focus on interactive keys. So I hear that quite a bit. And remember the iceberg there, 80% of the keys that you're gonna be looking at is automated access in nature. So let's go into the final part here before we jump into a demo. And we're gonna talk about compliance and getting that control. So what is actually the process to gain control about this environment? Hopefully you bought into the ideas that presented the use cases that presented the risk here that, wow, there, there may be an issue here within our enterprise. So what are regulators saying about this? I've never heard of an SSH key breach. I, I, our auditors haven't looked at this. Actually, SSH user key based access is starting to gain quite a bit of visibility when it comes to like a BC, PCI DSS, SOX compliance, Monetary Authority of Singapore, HIPAA, and whatnot. If you think of the access lifecycle management, SSH user key based access is now becoming a part of that. Ensuring segregation of duties, ensuring the access reviews and the recertification of this access, ensuring that third-party access using key-based authentication is being monitored, and production environment hardening. All of these cut across all of the regulatory drivers around this, and SSH user key-based access is absolutely relevant in this. Now, there are guidelines on this. SSH co-authored back in 2015, I think it was published in 2015, the NIST IR 7966, Security of Interactive and Automated Access Management using SSH. And this provides you the best practices and guidelines out there when it comes to managing SSH user key based access and SSH access in generally for your enterprise. And this is a free document which you can go find online <coughs> at NIST. Excellent source if this is a starting point in your organization and you're just starting to look at this. <clears throat> but actually going in, and thinking about how do we get this under control. First and foremost, what's really important is getting stakeholder alignment and executive sponsorship. Very frequently, this is not on the radar in our organizations at the C-level. Think about it, SSH. What have you thought about SSH your entire time that you've been working in your organization? It's an encryption method. It's always been looked upon as encryption. So it's never been considered as a means of access and therefore it's very frequently been forgotten. So. Getting this on the, on the radar of the organization is understandable. I mean, if you think about who works with SSH on a day-to-day -day basis, this is really low-level access in the environment to our most critical infrastructure. This is the Unix administrators of the world and whatnot. So it's not something that's sitting up there that's extremely visible in our environment. Identity and access management has a huge role in this. They have to drive the policies of what is permitted in our organization when it comes to this form of access for interactive and automated access. This is an identity access management issue. Security operations is going to play an enormous role in this. Unix operations is going to play a role in this because they're the ones who created the problem and they're going to be also part of cleaning it up in this because they know that environment, they know how the keys are being utilized. Application teams are going to come into play. 
first time you show an application owner their inbound and outgoing outgoing SSH user key based trust, they're never have done a seen them before. So they need guidance on what is non-compliant and what is compliant and what is driving a risk within the organization. And then other distributed platforms, as I said, this cuts across Windows, mid-range, and plays a key role into the mainframe. So you have multiple stakeholders involved in this. It's not a problem that is owned by one person. Very frequently, depending on the approach the customer's taking, cryptographic services may be involved in this as well. So how do we get alignment on policy? When we think of SSH, there's three components to keep in mind here. First is access-related policy. There are access-related policies that are driven the organization. There are cryptographic-related policies, which we'll talk about in a second, and configuration policies related to the protocol. So these three things need to be kept in alignment. Then you need to get, think about the risk prioritization around this. So here you see from the access policies, we have things like key ownership, segregation of duties. These are all the ones we were talking about here, and this is why it's primarily an access-related issue. However, there are cryptographic policies that we want to have around our keys. What should be the key algorithms, the key size? How do we utilize passphrase protection to harden things more? And then on the configuration management side, this is really an area that people forget about and quite frequently ignore. There's a lot of things that we can do to control our environment when it comes to the configuration of SSH to lock down accessing the environment, how it's being used from a sub-channel proto protocol perspective, what versions can be run, what algorithms can be run, how our timeouts affected, and how we log key-based activity. It's a really important part that needs to be taken in. So remember that there's three parts to this. In terms of gaining visibility, control, and governance, first thing that we need to do is we need to assess the state of our environment. So we need to get a snapshot of how big is this issue with our environment. From there, we need to gain a discovery capability where we map these out and link these back to identities. Every key in our environment for SSH user key-based access, regardless if that's for interactive access or machine-to-machine -machine connectivity, must have an owner. That is a basic principle that we need to start from. We need to monitor the access. We need to monitor from where the keys are authenticating and how frequently to be able to give us the intelligence as to what is still in use and what is obsolete. This also gives us the indication if a key is, for example, if we start to see anomalies. If a private key is all of a sudden authenticating from a, an, a location that it hasn't from in the past, this can trigger an uh, let's say, a forensic type of uh, activity. From there, once we have the visibility, we go into what we call remediation. This is locking down access. The real issue here is that SSH keys can be provisioned without oversight. We need to lock down access, get keys off the user's home directories, put these into a central remote location, and then remediate against our policies to constantly reduce the risk in our environment. And then from there, link this into a governance process in terms of how we automate provisioning, deprovisioning, and recertification to give us the full control of gaining visibility, control, and an ongoing governance. So before we jump in, I'm gonna hand this over to Jimmy for the demo. Some of the takeaways you should think of about here is who really owns this inside of my environment for identity access governance? Think about the mainframe from the perspective of this, of how SSH keys are being used. Do we have an inventory of SSH keys when we think of interactive and automated access? Are we monitoring those keys? Do we have accountability of the private keys around this? Do we have accountability of the public key side of this? And do we have a process for the ongoing governance in terms of provisioning, deprovisioning? And how are we intercooperating now if we're from the mainframe side and you're listening in on this? How are we cooperating today with the distributed platform when it comes to key-based access into our platform? So keep these in mind as you now go into the demonstration part of this. And so at this point, I'm going to hand this over to Jimmy for his demonstration because this is really going to bring to light some of the concepts that I was talking there about how we're going to gain control of this in our environment. Thank you for your attention. Over to you, Jimmy. Hello, my name is Jimmy Mills, and I'll be presenting the Universal SSH Key Manager. And out of simplicity, from this point on, you'll hear me refer to it as UKM. As you may now be aware, SSH keys can go unmanaged for years. When doing an initial discovery of the keys in an enterprise environment, they can be found on all platforms. Windows, Unix, and mainframe users use keys as their credentials to gain access for interactive and non-interactive sessions. So of course, discovering the data is one thing, but then how to make sense of it all. Combing through every key to determine if it is or isn't valid is extremely tedious and time consuming. UKM has built-in policies that can be used to help with this process. 
some of the more common policies we have assisted in remediating are segregation of duties, key size, and key age. Based on the recent NIST guidelines, keys should not exceed two years of age, but most organizations that we've worked with have defined their key age policy to be one year, and that is what I have defined here. UKM has found all of my non-compliant keys for me, and based on my score, I should certainly be doing a better job of rotating my keys. If I click on the private keys link, I can now see the full list of private keys and details about each of them. As an admin, I could click to renew the key or I could find the owner and report the violation to them. If I click to renew the private key, UKM would go through a staged process to first generate the new private key without overriding the current key. It will then deploy the public key to all known authorized locations and once each key has been deployed successfully, then UKM will overwrite the original private key. It works in this stage manner to ensure all processes can continue. To sum it up, no downtime, just business as usual. Besides the common policies which can be defined in UKM, other reports can be easily generated by parsing the data gathered. Though every organization is concerned about key age, key size, and other common requirements, there are still a wide range of drivers which have different levels of importance. Another common remediation task which we've encountered is to find and remove all unused or commonly referred to as orphan keys. UKM isn't just a key inventory tool, it can be used to find the usage or lack thereof by running key activity scans. From the authorized keys tab, I'll add a filter to find all keys that haven't been used in a specified period of time. Just in my environment, I have found 36 keys that have had no activity in the past six months. Typically, if a key is not used weekly or monthly, then the process or machine that was initially using it has since been decommissioned. However, six months still may not be long enough for some business processes, or it could be too long. Either way, whatever is defined, this tool can find those leftover keys and remove them from the environment. If for some reason a mistake has been made and a key was removed that is still being used, then UKM can also be used to restore that key. Now besides modifying, rotating, or removing keys, UKM can also be used to deploy new keys. We've been looking at the UKM front end web UI. Now I'll switch to the user portal. The user portal is a web interface which can be used by end users and application owners. It can be configured to authenticate local or LDAP accounts. Here, I'll be logging in as a user with his LDAP or actually AD credentials. He'll be taken to a screen where he can view his pending access requests, that is, if he had any. And from here, now he can submit a new access request. Keep in mind when it comes to SSH keys, there is a private key, otherwise known as the source, as well as an authorized key, otherwise known as the destination. Here he has an option to provide his own public key. This is useful in scenarios for users using their workstations to SSH into an environment, or could even be used by external users. For this request, he will select a source host and user account. User portal can be customized to restrict which hosts and users they can choose from. With this configuration, there are no restrictions he's going to choose a server prod01 and an application account for the source. Now he can define his destination or destinations if needed to access multiple hosts. For this request, he's going to choose a mainframe LPAR. Once he clicks next, he has the option to provide a ticket number. I'll just throw in something random here as I'm not integrated in any ticketing system. Now the end user can define aspects of the key. User portal can be configured to restrict what the end user can choose. As an example, you may not want them to choose anything below a size of 2048. So as you can see, I have already configured my portal to not allow 1024 or anything smaller. Once clicking next, the user can review the request before submitting it. Now you can see the request is in a waiting for approval state. Approvals can be configured a multitude of different ways. It can be configured based on application or host group. 
For this, it requires a UCAME admin to review and approve the request. As an admin, I will go to the Access Request tab and see any and all requests requiring approval. The admin can review the request and approve or deny it. If the admin determines the account and host is okay, they could still make changes to other aspects of it themselves before approving it. As an example, if the admin wants the authorized key to have an allow from restriction, then they can define one themselves before confirming the request. Also, validity periods can be defined for the keys. If this request came from a contractor, vendor, or anyone else where the access should be temporary, then an end date can be defined for this key. All keys with a defined validity period will be removed based on the date and time defined. This will happen automatically. No interaction from the admin is required. Now this concludes my presentation of the Universal SSH Key Manager. I appreciate your time. Great. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, let's go ahead and move into uh, the Q&A portion of our webinar. I'd also like to ask for some feedback from our attendees. So we're going to go ahead and uh, put up a poll. And while we uh, review your questions here, please feel free to um, submit your answers. Um, select your choices and hit Submit. Should be up momentarily. Great, thank you. And if you have a question and your Q&A um, tab is now minimized, just click there on the arrow to open it and um, enter your question. So appreciate your feedback there. First question, what needs to be installed on the mainframe to use SSH Key Manager? And maybe, Matthew, is that one for you? So. Basically, there's nothing that you need to install on the mainframe itself. Everything that we do with our SSH Key Manager, we do through an agentless connectivity. So what this basically means is we leverage the existing SSH connectivity, uh, SSH connectivity from the back end of our Key Manager. We elevate privilege into a user that she provides for us that has that privilege elevation, and then from there, we create that connection from the back end of our key manager, and we can run the operation on the host. So there's actually nothing that you would need to deploy on the mainframe itself. Okay, great. Um, what does this mean to me if we're still using FTP on the mainframe? Is that one best for Colin, or should I take that one? I'm Matthew, go ahead. Or right, Colin, or you, you just chime in? I think that's for Matthew or Janine. Great. Oh, okay, sure. So if you're still using FTP on the mainframe, then most likely you're not going to have key-based authentication in place. However, FTP, of course, in itself is not a secure protocol and is running, let's say, data in transit in clear text. So one of the things that SDS and SSH offer together is, of course, that ability to convert that FTP traffic transparently to create that into SFTP traffic on the mainframe, so convert those jobs into SFTP. And so that's exactly one of the combined components of the offering together with our key management to help our customers secure their mainframes more effectively. Great. Um, Colin, this one may be up your alley. How big of a problem are SSH keys for a mainframe environment? Yes, I can take that one, Janine. Um, so what we have been seeing in the industry is that all of the same security, audit, and compliance issues uh, businesses are finding in distributed environments are also a problem in mainframe environments. In fact, uh, these issues are magnified because of the important roles that mainframe play in businesses' environments today. So SSH is a widely used encryption protocol on all platforms, as we know, including the mainframe. Even if an organization's current mainframe environment hasn't transitioned from FTP to SFTP, we think it's only a matter of time before they do. Here's a good one. Just If keys are so bad, why use them? Matthew, what do you think, Matthew? You. <laughs> okay. So if you think about when the SSH protocol was created, um, basically, it, taking you back in the history, Tata Ulin created the SSH protocol 
to gain access to his computer at the university because his passwords were being sniffed. And using public key authentication, using SSH user keys, was a very convenient way for him to not have to retype his passwords. So he created the SSH protocol. As this was taken out into the open source community, it was seen as the most effective way to quickly generate automated processes and connectivity between applications. It's the most convenient way for, let's say, interactive usage. So it's been a, a way that we, how do we securely provision access um, quickly for our developers and people um, within our organization or our processes within our organization? Of course, there are other, other methods that we can use. Um, the reason why customers use public key authentication is because, let's say, deploying a full-blown PKI certificate approach around this is often a very burdensome task within our organization. So public key authentication is a quick, cost-effective way utilizing the protocol as it is today to, let's say, establish this secure access. Challenges is that organizations have managed this as an afterthought over the years and not from the beginning in terms of how they've used this um, key-based access. Okay, we're reaching the top of the hour. In fact, we're there, but I just don't want to um, skip over this question. Do you offer a free trial, and how is your product licensed? Be sure we get that answered before we okay. uh, conclude. Well, it's, this is Deb. I think I'll take that one, Janine, if it's okay. Right. Okay, so yes, we do offer a free trial. Um, we would provide you an evaluation license key for a trial. Um, and then how do we license the product itself? Well, we license a Universal Key Manager based on managed hosts. And I think in the case of uh, the mainframe environment, look at your LPAR as a managed host. So you'll need to consider how many LPARs you would want to uh, evaluate and, and look for um, SSH keys. And what I would suggest is if you have some interest in pursuing a proof of concept or a free trial, uh, please send us uh, an email, and, and you can see there the thank you slide shows um, info at sdsusa.com, and, and we'll certainly get back to you. Great. Um, and I'd like to encourage everybody to please go ahead and submit your answers to the survey. And um, thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And I especially want to thank Brian, Matthew, and Jimmy, uh, Deb, Colin, uh, for sharing your expertise with us today. Uh, later this week, we'll be sending out a link to the recording of today's webinar to everyone on the call, as well as to anyone who registered but for whatever reason couldn't attend today. That concludes our webinar. Thanks again, and have a great day.